Well, it's always nice to begin a new study. I guess, uh, you know, it's, it's a new beginning, it's a fresh start. It's perhaps a person we don't often focus on, gee, who is sort of uh, one of those kings that we sort of tend to gloss over in the chronology of the kings, but um, I, I'm not quite sure why I actually even chose the subject. <laughs> and I think it's because somehow I have a compulsion for stories that have sad endings. Um, if you remember my last study, it was on, on Abiathar, and a, again, Abiathar was uh, a young priest who became a high priest, who offsided with David, gave him a lot of comfort throughout the wilderness and was a very steadfast friend for a long, long time. But in the end, Abiathar defected and that was a very sad ending. And, well, tonight, it's another character with a sad ending. But maybe that's a bit like life, of course. And I think there is a very powerful lesson that is threaded through the life of Jehu. And the lesson is that we can't plateau in the truth. We have to not only maintain our energy and our enthusiasm, we have to grow in a very practical way in our, in our qualities and our attributes to be more like God. And again, you know, spiritual maturity is all about growing and developing. So we're taking this little example here and we're analysing Jehu, his life, uh, and sadly, of course, there was, there was a fade off toward the end. And perhaps we have to be prepared uh, and perhaps analyse our own selves to make sure that we're maintaining growth and spiritual development as far as God is concerned. So as a young man, he began very, very well. And as we say, he faded off toward the end. So it's all about choices, it's all about consequences. And on the backdrop, of course, of our special weekend that we had with Brother Jamie on lot, those choices are really, really critical. Uh, not only when we're younger in the truth, but as we go uh, and advance through truth, we still have choices that we have to make and there are consequences. And for Jehu, uh, toward the end, as we say, some bad choices were made. So we want to have a look over the next um, five sessions, really, the life of Jehu. Our first session tonight is on selection. We're going to have a look at how he was anointed. He was selected by Elisha for a particular task. He was given the authority of Yahweh. This prophet came from God with a special message for him. So it wasn't as though he was just um, um, invading the chronology of the kings on his own background. He was selected particularly by um, this young man who was a representative of Elisha for a particular task. In our second session, a little bit further on, we're going to have a look at the seriousness of Jehu. Uh, he had a task to do and he fully committed to that. He eradicated as much as he could the evil from the northern territory of those tribes. In our, in our third session, we're going to have a look at the strategy that he employed. Obviously, it wasn't just going in there and hoping everything was OK. There's a certain pathway that he took. Um, there's, in our fourth session, some separation as far as the truth was concerned. And then in our fifth session, as we say, you know, a little bit of a bad ending. Uh, there's a shortfall, there's a fade off toward the end. So again, the exhortation comes back to us. For many of us, we may have only been the truth two, three, four years, five years, 10, 20. Have we got that same enthusiasm, that energy, that love, that development, that growth? That's really, really important, of course, for, for our progression. So tonight, we're going to have a look at this selection and his anointing to be king over Israel, and we'll just explore a little bit of his character. So we've got uh, three aims that we want to um, follow through on the course of this particular series. And the first one is to be inspired by the energy and enthusiasm of Jehu. And of course, that's always an incentive for us. We tend to live in an age where everything's very moderate, and uh, we're very casual with everything, and we can become that in our relationship with God. So this was a man who had great energy and enthusiasm. And again, we need to be able to lean upon that example. Um, secondly, to be unwavering and decisive with a strong spiritual fortitude to help work through the tough issues that we might face. So again, you know, it wasn't easy for Jehu. I mean, he was up against the backdrop of Jezebel and all the environment that she created. So it wasn't as though he was just going to walk to the throne and sit on it. Uh, he really had to push that and progress that. And he was very decisive in the, in the pathway that he took. And again, you know, when we, we are challenged by certain issues in life, are we decisive? Do we take the godly path? Or do we weigh up on a lot of variations and then sort of make a detour? And our third little uh, lesson we want to take is to maintain a consistent positive growth in our devotion to God by being optimistic and helping others to grow by our example. So again, you know, these, there are some great positive examples in the Bible and perhaps we lean upon people that are very positive 
that we find uh, substantial in the truth and consistent in the truth there, people that we're attracted to, well, we, may be, we need to become that sort of person as well. We can't always just be fluctuating around and relying on others to give us support. We've got to grow into solid pillars of strength in the truth. So they're the aims that we want to accomplish through our series. Well, our background to Jehu doesn't actually begin in verse 1 of 2 Kings chapter 9. We actually have to wind back 12 years to where our story actually begins. So I want you to come back to 1 Kings chapter 19. It's back a few pages, I guess. Uh, and this is where the story of Jehu begins, actually back in the time of Elijah. So chronologically, and I'll show a bit of chronology in a minute, but we're actually winding back 12 years. And it's insightful for us because it shows that God works behind the scenes in our own lives, often a long, long period before a particular issue surfaces. And this is very much the case here. So 1 Kings chapter 19 is obviously about Elijah, and Elijah has just had his performance up on Mount Carmel, he, he was hoping for an amazing success. He was hoping for the whole nation of Israel to transition into worshippers of God, and that was a failure. And we know that Elijah was particularly depressed. He went all the way down to, to Horeb, uh, and there, of course, he had this little incident that showed him with a still small voice that it wasn't so much as a big fanfare of energy. Sometimes it was consistent and quiet words that encouraged people to make changes. But at the end of that whole scenario, there's little commission that Elijah was given. And so we just come across there to uh, verse 16, or oh, verse 15 really. It says, uh, Yahweh said unto him, Go return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you come, anoint Hazael to be king over... There's three things he has to do. Anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. Secondly, here's our little uh, connecting point. And Jehu, the son of Nimshai, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, son of Shaphat, of Abel Melholah, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. Then he goes on, it shall come to pass that whoever escapes the sword of Hazael, Jehu will slay, and he that escapeth from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Now, what's the point of all that? Well, the interesting uh, fact of all that is that Elijah didn't do that. He was given a commission. There were three tasks, very clearly here, to anoint three different people, and Elijah didn't do that. In fact, he only did one of those tasks, and that was the anointing of Elisha. And there's a particular point. We might think, well, wonder why he didn't do that, um, those three tasks, those three anointings. Why didn't Elijah fulfil his commission? Well, when we have a look at who these people are, um, obviously there has a yield was a foreign king, he's right up in Syria, he's in Damascus, and he was going to execute a, a sword of justice upon the nation of Israel. Uh, secondly, there was a new king, Jehu, who was going to bring destruction on Israel. And thirdly, there was going to be a prophet, Elisha, who would bring renewal to Israel. Now, interestingly, Elijah only commissioned Elisha. He only did that third part. And I wonder if the backdrop to that particular story was Elijah was starting to learn the lesson of the still small voice, that it wasn't all about destruction. Destruction doesn't always convert people. And so he was hesitant to um, anoint those other two individuals. Instead, he just anointed Elisha because he, he recognised the need for renewal. And a little, little, little bit later on, we'll find out, of course, that Elisha took on board these other two anointings. So that's interesting because this is our beginning start to the life of Jehu and he's mentioned here. Now this particular point is 12 years before Jehu actually was anointed. So when we have a look at chronology and you might have this little chart in your Bible, well, this was of course before Ahab died. All right, so here's, here's the reign of Ahab here. We've got his son, well his grandson, there's two sons here. Uh, Joram reigned a little bit longer, of course, but here's Jehu here. He doesn't begin until around about 12 years after chronologically this initiation. So again, it's sort of a, a very interesting aspect to how God works behind the scenes in our lives. Sometimes, you know, a situation happens and we expect God to be working at it. We may not realise that God actually began that whole process a decade before putting people in particular positions to help support us or, or give us direction in life. 
So there's a 12 year gap uh, between the starting point of our story and perhaps the, the main narrative back there in 2 Kings uh, chapter 9. So here's a little bit of background as well, just to paint the picture a little bit more. Here's the chronology, well this is the chronology of course of the Southern Territory, uh, Judah and Benjamin, and up here is the Northern Territory, this is what we're dealing with. Here's Jehu here, of course uh, Ahab and Jezebel there in the time of Elijah, and then Jehoram began to reign, Ahaziah married, well, well that was the, the, um, the daughter of Jezebel married Jehoram over here, so there was sort of a family connection there as well. Ahaziah didn't last very long, it was only a year, and then Jehoram began his reign, and this is the one that uh, Jehu took out. So here's uh, Jehu here, he begins in 841 BC, and he begins a long dynasty, a long genealogy of at least four sons and grandsons and great-grandsons, around about 88, 90 years of the history of Israel. So this is a particular change in the dynasty here, um, as was prophesied by Elijah, the removal of the Ahab-Jezebel uh, co coordination there. Jehu in one day took out two kings. I mean, this is our next session. Um, quite amazing, his energy and enthusiasm. He didn't dilly-dally around. Two kings just straight away in one day, one swift moment, were taken off the board. So quite an incredible beginning to the reign of Jehu. And of course, he executed that quite thoroughly. So as far as Jehu is concerned, uh, interesting little background. And we're coming back to 2 Kings chapter 9. We've um, already found out that the background is 12 years earlier. God was already aware of this young man. So it would seem when we work out the chronology that Jehu was around about perhaps early 20s when God gave that commission to Elijah to go and anoint him. And I always think that's interesting as a point of observation that you know God doesn't necessarily wait till we're mature till we're 40 or 50 or 60. Sometimes like in the life of David God is very aware of where our heart is and where, where our love and our devotion is. So he's already seen in Jehu in his early 20s that he has a love for the things of God in a very bad environment. And Jehu had no hesitation in taking out the originators of that bad environment, which of course was the descendants of Ahab and Jezebel. So right in his early 20s, he's got a love for God. God recognises that. And there's a little bit of forward planning on the part of, the, of God that one day he would be selected to execute judgment upon the house of Ahab. So, you know, early 20s, so another 12, 12 years go, goes by. He's around about possibly mid-30s now, here back in 2 Kings chapter 9 when he's anointed. So that just gives us a bit of a, a background um, so we can evaluate his, his age. So coming back to 2 Kings chapter 9, as, a little, as we've said, that was the background. 12 years has passed by. Now in 2 Kings chapter 9 and verse 1, Elisha gives his commission and it says, uh, he called one of the children of the prophets and said unto him, gird up your loins. So there's this sense of urgency in that phrase, isn't it? It's like gird up your loins, get ready to go. There's, there's an urgent thing you've got to do. We sort of say, well, wonder why that was. I mean, 12 years have gone by. It's not as though it was something that he had to do in a hurry, was it? Well, actually it was because if you look at the previous verse, chapter 8 and verse 29, the two kings have come together. So chapter 8 and verse 29 says, King Joram went back to be healed in Jezreel of the wounds which he'd had just in battle there uh, when he fought against Hazael, king of Syria. And, and Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, went down to see Joram because, uh, um, because the son of Ahab in Jezreel was sick as well. So here's the two kings. They've come together. They're um, confederating together. And um, this is the moment, of course, that Elisha suggested to this young man, take action now, gird up your loins and go. So the armies were encamped at Ramoth Gilead and Jehu was out there, he's captain of the army. He was defending Ramoth Gilead against the enemy. But meanwhile, the two kings were sort of idling away there in Jezreel. And this was a moment, 12 years had gone by, um, Elisha now initiates this young man to go and begin this whole process. 
So he's commanded to go and anoint him. So verse 3 says, take this box of oil, pour it on her head and give this commission that Yahweh uh, has authorised him to be the king of the northern tribes and to take action against the house of Ahab. So what's interesting is that Jehu is the only king, he's the only king to ever be anointed in those northern territories. So of course we know, you know, the kings of, of Judah were generally reasonably faithful there was never really a, a good king at all up in the northern territories at all. He's the only one that was ever anointed. So, of course, what kings had been anointed? Well, obviously, Saul had been anointed by Samuel. David was anointed by Samuel, um, obviously, to mark the authority of God on this young person, David, as he prepared to take the, the throne. Solomon was anointed by the high priest Zadok and Nathan as well. So... This whole anointing process is one that gives the authority of God to a particular person. And Jehu was the only one up in the north who ever was anointed. And that was reinforcing, I guess, for him because it, it gave him the authoritative approval from God or from the, the prophet, as it were, to move ahead with this particular commission. So he reigned for uh, around about 28 years, uh, Jehu did. Uh, he's the second longest reign, apart from Jeroboam, his great-grandson. And as we've said, his contemporaries were Queen Athaliah down in the south and then the young King Joash. You'll remember King Joash was protected. Athaliah destroyed all the seed royal down in Judah. Uh, she ascended, usurped the throne, as it were, ho horribly brutal person. Uh, so that was contemporary, really, with Jehu. It was Athaliah down there and then Joash. So he, um, as we've said, had four uh, dynasties that he put in place, so quite a substantial reign. Now, one of the interesting things about archaeology is that we have a record of Jehu. So, you know, again, this is a wonderful fact. The Bible isn't just full of made-up fairy tales of people that never existed, figments of someone's imagination documented in stone. And this is the black, os uh, black obelisk of Shalmanes III. So it's quite important because it's the only portrayal we have in the ancient Near East uh, of an Israelite or a Judean monarch. Here, he is here. So he's in the Hebrew scriptures and here he is here. It's the earliest depiction of an Israelite. So when I was reading up on this particular article and here's the obelisk here and here I am in younger years there at the British Museum pointing it out in fact, I look as though I've got a, a print of the obelisk on my shirt. I don't even know why I'm wearing that obelisk, why, that, why I'm wearing that shirt. I'm lucky I wasn't arrested. I was going out for taking something from the museum. But anyway, here I am pointing to Jehu. Now, here he is here. Now, you notice all these are in their royal garments. And what they're saying here is here he's, he's been stripped of his royal garment. He's basically in his underwear um, as a, a, a point of embarrassment. And he's bowing before... Um, Shalmaneser III. So this is the Assyrian king. So there is some documented proof of Jehu. Obviously we read about his enthusiasm and his energy but of course when it came to the superpower of Assyria then he was sort of humbled uh, quite dramatically. Well verse 1 talks about just at the end of verse 1 there's this place Ramoth Gilead and again it's mentioned in verse 4. Go to Ramoth Gilead. Now we might not know we might just think, oh, well, that was probably, you know, around the corner from Bethlehem or something. So where is Ramoth Gilead? So the prophet Elisha was not in the land of Israel at this time, uh, and he gave commission to this young prophet to actually go down to Ramoth Gilead. So when we put a map up here, Ramoth Gilead or Damascus, this is where Elisha was. So 2 Kings 8 verse 7 is the previous chapter say he was up there anointing Hazael. And as he's anointing that king, he says to a young prophet, go down and anoint Jehu because the time's come. So it all happened with, with great acceleration. So he's right, Elisha's right up here in this area. Uh, Ramoth Gilead is right over here. That was one of the um, tri uh, refuge, cities of refuge, six cities of refuge, three on either side of the Jordan River. So that was one of the cities of refuge. It was under the control or had been under the control of the Syrians and now Jehu with his army had come 
and they've taken control of that and they're just reinforcing it. And of course, across here is Jezreel where the two kings were and they were just sort of recuperating across here. So he tells one of the sons of the prophets to go down here and to anoint Jehu and of course eventually Jehu's going to come across there to Jezreel to exterminate these um, two kings. So Ramoth Gilead was lost to the, the Syrians previously. Uh, first to Kings 22 and verse 3 talk about that. That was the battle where Ahab and Jehoshaphat in, went together and Ahab was mortally wounded and he died of those wounds. You might remember um, he was a bit worried about giving some or, or receiving some divine instruction as to whether this would be okay. Micaiah was the prophet at that particular time. So Ahab, King Ahab was mortally wounded there at Ramoth Gilead and he died from his wounds. And as we looked at uh, verse 29 of the previous chapter, obviously Joram has now been wounded as well. So that this is interesting, interesting as much showing is that Jehu, now mid-30s, of course, he's out on the battlefield. He's not cringing in some dark corner wondering, well, you know, who's going to do something as far as the nation is concerned? I mean, I guess sometimes in ecclesial life we just step back and we say, I wonder who's going to do something. So, well, Jehu was, was not cringing in some dark corner. He's out there defending the nation. And now he's going to go to the next level where he starts to remove and eradicate the wickedness out of the nation because he's been anointed by one of the sons of the prophets. So it's almost as though, you know, the spirit of Elijah is now seen in this man himself. Remember, Elijah had been on the battlefield up at Mount Carmel, had been disappointed with the nation, and he wondered where it was all going to go, and that command came, well, you go and anoint um, Jehu. He didn't get around to that, but Jehu certainly was almost in the footsteps of Elijah, almost the same spirit of Elijah. So Jehu was a captain in the army of Israel. Obviously, as we progress in the narrative, we'll find that he had a great reputation amongst his own soldiers, his men. They supported him. And uh, he um, submitted, as we know, to the instructions of this son of the prophets. So he had a great reputation. He was a warrior. People obeyed him. He had in energy he had enthusiasm and so we read in verse 2 of this introduction and there's a bit of a, a compression of his family there in verse 2 so it says look out there Jehu the son of Jehoshaphat the son of Nimshai now names are always important in the Bible because they give us a lesson and it's no different here so Jehu means Yahweh is he Yahweh is he Jehoshaphat means Yahweh is guide and Nimshai is very interesting. It means to rescue or to draw out. It's actually an extension of Moses' name. That word Nimshai comes from a root word that's used in Exodus 2 and verse 10, the word draw out. So Nim Nimshai means to rescue or to draw out, and it's an extension of Moses' name. So it's almost like, well, Jehu's now going to give a great exodus for the people of Israel. It's almost like an echo of what Moses achieved many years before. So when we put all that together, it's Yahweh is the guide who will rescue or draw out or extract Israel from their downward spiral. All right. So there we, we, we put that whole sentence together. So it really probably summarises what God was doing in the nation. Yahweh is the guide. He's going to rescue. He's going to draw out. He's going to extract Israel from their downward spiral and give them an opportunity of hope. So that's his name. So back to the narrative again. And very interesting in verse 3, um, Elisha says, take the box of oil, pour it on his head and say, thus saith Yahweh, I have anointed thee to be king over Israel, and then open the door and run. <laughs> sort of, what? It's a rather strange sort of, you know, one would imagine all the prestige of a, a, anointing to be king would, would sort of have some elements of consideration. You know, gather all the men around and we'll have a, sort of some music and some trumpets playing and we'll, we'll anoint you and it'll be an amazing ceremony. It was none of that. It's like anoint him and then run. <laughs> and again, at the end of verse 10, well, it's the son of the prophet fulfilled that because end of verse 10 it says he opened the door and, and ran. Well, this is going to be interesting. So who is this young man in verse 4? And you'll notice, again, I love how the narrative puts this and it's 
Really important for us to read the Bible as it is. Verse 4. So the young man, even the young man, well, you know, obviously he's emphasising to us this is a young man. Well, this is one of the nobodies nobody knows. But it's emphasising the narrative there that he's young, he had a focus, he had a determination. So you can imagine him perhaps as a, as a Nazarite, he's got these long flowing locks and he gets on his horse. Elijah's instructed to do, do this to anoint Jehu. He's on his horse, his, his black hair is flowing back, he comes thundering through the camp of Israel. He bursts into the inner sanctum of the uh, commanders and, and the chiefs are all discussing their strategy. Uh, and they say, what are you doing here? And he says, I've come with a message. And they say, well, who for? And he says, well, you, O king. And so they go into this sort of inner room and then next minute this Nazarite comes running out and he's on his horse and he's off. Like, well, that was all over in a couple of minutes. So really it's the spirit of Elijah, isn't it? Like where it says there at the end of verse 3, he opened the door and fled and the introduction there. Remember how we're introduced to Elijah? But there's an interesting thing. He obviously expands on uh, what he's saying to Captain Jehu because we've got that in, you know, verse 5, 6, uh, 7, 8, 9 and 10. But what's interesting, I'd like to just pick out a little phrase in verse 6. So it says there, He rose, uh, went into the house, he poured the oil on of his head and said unto him, Thus saith Yahweh, Elohim of Israel, I have anointed you king over the people, the people of Yahweh, even over Israel. It's almost like a... A couple of levels there, isn't there? But did you notice the phrase, the people of Yahweh? I mean, these are the northern tribes. These are the people who have been suffering under the irrepressible hand of Ahab and Jezebel, all the prophets of Baal and all their worldly worship. These people had been led astray in, in a horrible way. And we may have imagined that under the hand of Ahab and Jezebel, God had completely disregarded all those northern tribes. Uh, you know, they're wayward, they don't understand the truth, they should be forgotten and taken off into captivity. But it's, it's quite wonderful, isn't it? Because in that verse 6, it's my people of Israel. And in verse 7, we have it added, my servants, the prophets, the servants of Yahweh. So God remembered his original promise to exterminate the house of Ahab and Jezebel and give reprieve to the northern people. And so there's this special expression there, I have anointed you to be king over the people of Yahweh. The people of Yahweh. Doesn't that show God's incredible mercy? Here's a wayward people influenced by Jezebel rejecting the temple worship because they'd set up calves in Dan and Bethel, but God still accounted them as his people. And he now motivated Jehu to, to move and to make some change in that, in that environment in the hope that his people would turn again to true worship. Well, I think that's pretty amazing and that's very encouraging for us in our own lives, isn't it? Because sometimes we think, or we, perhaps we've made a decision or we've placed ourselves in an environment that's disconnected us from God. And we tend to think, well, you know, I've made this decision, it's a bad decision, but I guess I've just got to live with it and, you know, God doesn't like me anymore. And that's not the case because here we have a, a very clear incident that even although these people had suffered and, and, and gone down a, a bad pathway, God was still wanting to protect them, encourage them and develop them. And that's the same for us, brothers and sisters, when we make a bad decision or we find ourselves in a dark space, let's never think that God's forgotten us or doesn't want us for the kingdom. He's given us an invitation and like the people in, in this situation, he wants to draw us out and to encourage us and give us direction. Peter puts it this way, 1 Peter 2, 9, he says, you're a don't forget this, he says, you're a chosen generation, you've been called to a royal priesthood, you are to be a holy nation, you are a special people that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. I mean, that's almost the duplication there in the New Testament of Peter saying, let's not forget the graciousness with which God has reached out and touched us. 
And again, I just think it's so lovely that in this terrible environment, this darkness, this blackness, this waywardness of this people, that they're called the people of Yahweh. Just quite amazing. And I wonder, do we realise how special we are in the sight of God? You know, seven billion people, there's just a handful of us who've come to open the Bible to think about God and his ways and try and recalibrate our lives. Well, Malachi says this, chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, he says, those that fear Yahweh, they spake often one to another. It's what we're doing tonight. It's what we're doing right now. And Yahweh hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written for him. For them that feared Yahweh and that thought upon his name, and Yahweh said, they're going to be mine, and I'm going to make them my jewels. So, you know, tonight we've come together to spend an hour talking about the things of God, and in the sight of God, that's very precious. He's made a note of that. And I think that can be very encouraging for us, depending on what particular path we're on, that God still wants us to be part of his treasure in that kingdom that will soon be established. Well, of course, this young man had an incredible commission. Um, you know, it wasn't that uh, he had something nice to say. I mean, we all like to have conversations and to compliment people and say nice things about people. It's not very often that we, you know, come face to face, eyeball to eyeball with someone and give them a good dressing down. But I mean, this is the message. You're going to destroy the family of your master Ahab. I'm going to revenge, get revenge on Jezebel for the shedding of the blood of my servants and the prophets and all Yahweh's servants. Ahab's entire family will die. I'm going to destroy every male from Ahab's family, whether slave or freeman. I'm going to make Ahab's family like the family of Jeroboam. But this is really quite uh, confronting, this message that was taken to Jehu. And the message was... You're going to take out the king and you're going to take out the whole dynasty of Ahab and Jezebel and anyone who's associated with them. You need to do that. So that was a wake-up call for Jehu and a wake-up call for the nation. And I wonder whether sometimes, you know, we need a wake-up call because we've become very tolerant, haven't we? I mean, society now uh, is very embracing on, on, on any sort of lifestyle and you're looked as intolerant if, if you don't accept or embrace. I mean, here's Parliament just a few years ago. Uh, they're all hugging, they're kissing one another. They've just approved same-sex marriages, you know, legally across Australia. And this now is filtering down to all of us. And, you know, are, are we respecting God's principles? Or, you know, are we sort of embracing this aspect of toleration? And there's a little note there, sadly in our day, it's considered worse to judge evil than to do evil. You know, if, if you make a statement about people's lifestyle, uh, then that's considered evil. That's particularly sad. So this is a wake-up call that Jehu was commissioned that the people of God should no longer tolerate the evil in their midst. You know, when we, we have to disfellowship someone, we cringe a little bit, don't we? Um, we don't like disfellowship at all. Sometimes brothers and sisters just walk away from the truth. They don't want anything to do with it. And we have to get to that point where we say, well, you know what? Uh, you're no longer in fellowship with us because you're taking a completely different pathway. And this is really sort of what that's about in a modern day context. And obviously it's right, as we do now, to be very cautious about that process because we want to encourage brothers and sisters to recalibrate themselves back on a right pathway. So we're very cautious about going down that particular pathway. We, we want repair and rebuilding rather than extermination. But just imagine if that was you and you got that commission. Imagine yourself as Jehu and this young guy with flowing locks comes in, he's a Nazarite, and he tells you that you've got to go and speak roughly to some brothers and sisters uh, and tell them to get out of here because you're a bad influence. Do you reckon you could do it? I don't think I could. This is a very tough commission. But perhaps in an age of tolerance, brothers and sisters, we need to draw a line in the sand, do we? Is this, is this the lesson that, that's here in the context of this chapter? That God had had enough and he's now commissioning Jehu to go draw a line in the sand and to say to brothers and sisters, hey, get your lives in order. You can't just plateau maybe that's a lesson to us as well, that we've become comfortable uh, as far as perhaps our, our own morality is concerned. We need to draw 
a line in the sand, a little questionnaire. Do you actually have a line in the sand? Where is it? Do you draw it? Have you ever drawn a line in the sand? Have to say, no more. So that's very strong language, of course, but for ourselves, you know, we, we've got to, again, revisit this and perhaps question as to, to where we are as far as our spiritual development is concerned. Now, we might find that commission or that language that that young man had to say to Jehu a little bit confronting, a little bit, well, was it over the top? But you know what? The most merciful man that has ever lived uses the same sort of language. And here it is here. It's the language of Jesus. It's in the book of Revelation. It's about people that he finds offensive. Again, Revelation 2.20 says, I've got a few things to say against you because you suffer that woman Jezebel or her teachings or her immorality or her uh, lackadaisical attitude. She calls herself a prophet. Yes, and she wants to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication and eat things sacrificed to idols. I'm going to kill her children with death. I mean, that's, that's the statement of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, again, we, we, we might cringe when we, we, we read that radical statement there, but in actual fact, God wants us to be serious about our life and the truth. It's not just about coasting along uh, and sort of dabbling in ev everything and hoping we'll make the kingdom and God's mercy will be a, a wonderful umbrella for us. No, we've got to draw a line in the sand, we've got to be faithful, we've got to be committed, and we've got to live the morality that God expects us to live. So that language, of course, is very, very um, confronting. So it would take a lot of courage for both this young man to deliver the message and also for Jehu, sideline to my uh, daily occupation. No, his commission is to be king and leader of the people of God. And it wasn't just that aspect of kingship that Jehu wanted to embrace. He went beyond that, didn't he? He didn't just sort of put himself on the throne, didn't remove the kings and say, well, I'm here now, I'm the king, I'm going to enjoy a great life, I'm going to kick back a little bit and, you know, have some time for myself. No, he was very, very thorough. He actually had a commitment to the things of God. He was absolutely thorough. He wanted to remove every solitary influence, bad influence from the nation. So he didn't leave it half done once he was king. So, you know, this message was, was given. And verse 11, it says, uh, Then Jehu came forth to the servants of his Lord, and they said, Well, you know, what's going on? You'll notice this little, pr little phrase, um, is it well, in verse 11? Is it well? It's the same in verse 17. At the end of verse 7, it's got, is it peace? That word well is the, well sh the word shalom. Is it shalom? Is it peace? Is everything okay? Same as the end of verse 17, is it peace? Same at the end of verse 19, or, or halfway through, is it peace? 19. And in verse 22... Is it peace, Jehu? All right, so it's a sort of a, a, is everything fine? Is everything going okay? Now, I think in verse 11, we've got a little bit of a, a sense of humour in the Bible. You know, we often say, well, is there any humour in the Bible? See, it seems to be a very serious book. But if you look at the narrative and you paint the picture, it's got to be pretty funny because in verse 11, these captains, these men around Jehu saying, what's with this guy? I mean, he's just coming here, he's, you know, he's got long hair, he's a Nazarite, he's probably one of these sons of the prophets, he's a weirdo, he's mad. You know, he's ba he, these guys just babble about nothing. They're totally mean. He's full of crazy rubbish and lies. What did he say? And Jehu says, well, he said, I'm going to be king. And then you notice in the narrative, they scrabbled around, threw off their garments and said, Jehu's king. So, so much for all this, you know, mad, madness and, and babbling. Suddenly they believed it and, you know, within two minutes they're, they're throwing their garments down saying, oh, gee, who's king? So, sort of a, a, a funny scenario, but perhaps it also gives us a bit of an insight into Jehu because he was supposed to be in an inner chamber with this message. You notice in verse 2, right at the end of verse 2 it says, and carry, take him into an inner chamber. He, the margin says, um, chamber in a chamber. All right, so this young prophet, son of the prophet, could have given the message in front of those men before, couldn't he? But he took Jehu right into an inner chamber. The reason, obviously, is to give Jehu time to absorb the message and to build a strategy, which Jehu didn't do. He just came out and said, well, I'm going to be king, and then everyone scrabbled around and bowed before him. So, you know, it seems as though 
Gee, he was a little bit belligerent, maybe. He's not sort of harmonious, and he didn't really plan this little scenario as well as he could have. And the point is that God uses all different types of people, doesn't he? You know, within our, I won't say within our ecclesia, but within the ecclesia of God, sometimes we have people that are quite blunt. I don't mind blunt people. I'm okay with blunt people, and I think they deliver a good message and sometimes it's a bit hard to digest, but I say at least they're honest and they're truthful. Most of us tiptoe around people. We don't want to offend them. But Jehu was sort of a person who was, I, I guess he's pretty blunt, and he just said it as he thought it, and he delivered as it should have been delivered. So I don't think we should always discard a message from a, from a blunt brother or sister because maybe there's some genuineness in what, what they're saying. I always remember the early MIC class when we were young brethren and we used to, you know, we thought we delivered one of the greatest talks ever and then there'd be a few brethren that stood up and said, you know, that was probably the worst talk I've ever heard. You obviously didn't prepare and it was delivered, you know, you mumbled or whatever. So it was always good for us to take criticism on board and I, I think sometimes that can be helpful. So you notice there, of course, that they're throwing all their garments down. Oh, gee, who's going to be king? There's a little reference now in verse 16. Um, so gee, who's now on his chariot and he's heading to Jezreel. I mean, it's as though he didn't even stop for a breath. It's like just rolling through now. He's going to be king. So gee, who rides in a chariot, verse 16, he's going to Jezreel. For Joram lay there. And here's this big mistake from Ahaziah. Ahaziah, king of Judah, was come down. See that word down? It's not down. To see Joram for less than a year. Right? Less than a year. He's come uh, to connect to him because he's related to Joram. Joram is his uncle, right? Through marriage. So he's come or down or up, however geographically you want to imagine it. He's related to his uncle here through marriage because he's the son of Jehoram and Athaliah. And Athaliah was the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. Big, big mistake. So what's happening here? Well, here's a little uh, uh, geographical map so you can see what's going on. Here's Ramoth Gilead. Okay, so this is where Jehu was. And he's going to come down. This This is Jezreel today. All right, this is the Jezreel Valley. This is the, where um, the, king, the king was. Uh, this... That's Jezreel there. This is Mount Gilboa here. You remember a battle with Saul. Saul and Jonathan lost their lives there. This is the valley of Jezreel. And uh, this is the road that Jehu would have, you know, rode his chariot. This is the Jordan Valley here. And across there, of course, is eastward, Edom and Moab. So that's where Ramoth Gilead was. So Jehu is coming up to this town of Jezreel. Verse 17, a watchman sees... He spies a company, verse 17. So there's a whole host of men. They were supporting Jehu. And of course, uh, here they come in their chariots. There's a multitude of them. And we notice in verse 20, a couple of uh, messengers go out to see what's going on. And they turn behind Jehu. And there's a little note there. And I, I guess this is probably the main thing we always, all remember about Jehu. It says he's, tri he's driving is like the driving of Jehu, the son of Nimshai. He driveth furiously so that word driveth in verse uh, 20 is the Hebrew word nahag and it means to impel a determination to have focus so it's as though his chariot swaying erratically he's driving furiously it's almost as though it's up on one wheel what's interesting is that word and I never realized this the same word this word driveth is used in first chronicles 13 verse 7 I'm not going to go there but this is when um, Uzzah and Ohio drove the car. First Chronicles 13 verse 7 says, They carried the ark of God in a new car out of the house of Abinadab, and Uzzah and Ohio drove the car and the oxen stumbled. It's almost, you get the sense that uh, these two men want to get rid of, the, rid of the ark. They dumped it on a cart and they, you know, bashed the, the oxen to get going. And the oxen sort of lurch off and they're away and they're driving it. And the oxen stumbled and the, remember the ark fell and Uzzah put out his hand to stop it. So it's as though they sort of wanted to get rid of this and, and on its way. And it's the same word here that's used of Jehu. Uh, it says he, he, at the end of verse 20, he drives furiously. You, you margin will have the word madness. It's the Hebrew word shige on it. Strong defines it as craziness. So he's got a known reputation for this 
particular driving. He's a persistent, intensive, determined, resolute person. And you can get the idea of who he is from the end of verse 24, which we'll look at in our next session. Verse 24, Jehu drew a bow with his full strength. All right, so what it's telling us is he never did anything half-hearted. If he's driving a chariot, he's going flat out. If he's pulling a, 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 an arrow back, it's going to be with his full strength. There's vigour and there's determination. And it can be a good quality. All right, Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 10 says, Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, because once you're dead, there's nothing. There's no work, device, knowledge, wisdom in the grave where you're going to go. So the lesson to us is like what we're doing in the truth, we need to have our full energy involved in it. This is not something we do part-time. We're not part-timers. We're 100% committed to growing in our relationship with God. And so this is Jehu. He's a very determined person. In fact, if you just come over the page to chapter 10 and verse 16, there's another incident we'll look at at a further session. Uh, and I sort of like the, the, the way the narrative is presented. He meets up with Jonadab, the Rechabite. And uh, verse 16 says, this is Jehu. Jehu says, come with me and see my zeal for Yahweh. And then it says, so they made him ride in his chariots. as though Jonadab's thinking, I, I don't want to get in the chariot with this guy. You know, where's, where's the seatbelt? Where's the, where's the, the safety harness? Um, it's like he, they, they made him ride in the chariot, so he's reluctant to do it. Well, what's interesting about that word furious is the word madness, and there's only two other occasions. Deuteronomy 28, verse 28. It says, God will smite you with madness and blindness. Zechariah 12, verse 4 is the only other reference. And it says, in that day I will smite every horse with astonishment and his rider with madness. It's talking about the world that we're living in. Zechariah is talking about the time when the world will become mad. There'll be nations will be assembling themselves at Jerusalem. There'll be a whole spirit of madness. Armageddon will blow up and fortunately Jesus will return. So this furiousness, which is a part of the character of Jehu, is sort of seen in the way people behave erratically without too much thought. Spirit of madness. And really it's, it's used in Revelation 16, verse 13 and 14 to describe the whole atmosphere, the environment, of people in the world, frustrated, furious, angry, erratic. I mean, this, we're seeing that. So Revelation 16, 13 and 14 says, I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast and the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs, they are de demonic spirits. They're spirits of madness. And it says they're going to go forward to all the kings of the earth. Well, that's liberty, equality, fraternity, the spirit of the French Revolution that we're seeing now. This spirit of madness is just encompassing the earth. And Jehu, of course, is that sort of person in, in one sense. Is He's got a, a particular focus of eradicating. In, in this context, it's probably a good thing because he wants to remove all the evil, all the wickedness, uh, in that, those northern territories so that this can become a place of worship for God. Will he succeed or not? Well, I guess that's going to be our, our future ses sessions that will uncover that. So what are some of the lessons then we've learned in this brief sort of introduction to Jehu and the man that he was? Well, here's the takeaways. Jehu was known for his leadership, his enthusiasm and his focus. He had a reputation. Uh, once that message came out, all his, his captains threw off their, their robes and says, you, you're king, because they knew he was that sort of person. What sort of reputation do you think you have with other brothers and sisters? What, you know, what are the qualities that you're known for? Is it, is it focus and determination? Is it love of the truth? Is it consistency? You have to answer that. Same here. Uh, he did not delay when he received his anointing and the task he was appointed for. Are we consistent supporters of ecclesial functions or do we find them inconvenient? I mean, when we look at our life in the truth, I understand it's not, you know, just because we come here we get a tick. But it is part of who we are. We enjoy fellowship with each other. It's like Malachi says, we speak to one another about the things of God. This is what we like. This is what we love. Is that who we are? Uh, he was clearly decisive and focused on the path ahead. And again, you know, do we have focus or is this just a part-time sort of interruption to our week? Workplaces, you know, if we're going to university, wherever we are, have we been influenced by that? Have we become a little bit more tolerant than we should be? 
Or are we carrying the spirit of Jehu who has an intensity for right and wrong, draws a line that's clear for him? So there are the opening lessons, brothers and sisters, as we continue to look at the life of this very enthusiastic man who wanted to do initially what was right for God.